them. I already did a little bit. You did a
religious, religion, art, and so on. These are the concepts, the notions with which we want to operate here, and with which also the critical theorists worked. So that is our triple discourse, number two, and we discuss that a little bit more. And the discourse is also called then uh, mutual understanding and recognition. That is Habermas and Hannes, whom we also bring in. So we have from Habermas and Hannes, are the three people uh, on whom we want to concentrate, right? All of are from the Frankfurt School, all of the good theories, all are colleagues of from. So, and uh, so mutual understanding and recognition, and then a source of pathology. Pathology has something to do with uh, uh, illness and of reason and of freedom. So pathology of reason and freedom, and then how we can heal that, how it can be healed. So that is our theme today. Uh, I introduced myself the last time, and some of you know me anyway, and you can also look at the trailer, and as Professor Dustin Bird is also on the trailer, and we saw the trailer the last time. But the trailer is also, we don't have to show it again, is also on the website. So look on the trailer, and today we want to click on the trailer, and then you see a lecture there on the critical theory of society and religion, and we want to see a few scenes on Freud and on Marx, because they are behind from, from combined Freud and Marx, and so we have to know a little bit about them. Okay, <coughs> now we want to have a short self-introduction, so that we know each other, can you just <coughs> give us the name and what, you, uh, what your major is, and where you come from, and where you want to go to. Okay, we can start with you. My name is Yasser uh, Tami. Uh, I'm doing my MBA. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, with us here on campus? Yes. Oh, good, yeah. I'm doing my MBA and mm -hmm. also uh, trying to do my second uh, <coughs> class on uh, economics. Okay. Uh, Very good. And so that's how you got to us here? Yes. My and where, uh, are you from? where are you from? Uh, from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, right. Where? Which place? From Riyadh. But we have a uh, capital, unbelievable, very good, yeah. yeah. My undergrad was in business and religion. Okay, yeah, very good, I know. And then, what do you want to do? Or do you want to do the MBA? Do you want to work in this, then stay here, or uh, go no, home? No, go or home, for sure. Go home, for sure? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, yeah, my name is Simon Purdy. Uh, I'm in the sociology department at Western, okay. uh, working on a PhD in my first year. Uh, do you know already what you want to work on? Uh, yeah, I, ha I have uh, a couple things. I just finished up my master's uh, last spring looking at how uh, internet use affects civic engagement on uh -huh. the college campus, uh, like group memberships and things like that. So I kind of like to uh, okay. work along those same lines with uh, the technological influence on society. Okay, very good. Sounds interesting. And where do you come from? Um, originally from Lansing. And I did my undergrad up in uh, the Upper Peninsula here in Michigan, uh -huh. and then at Lake Superior State. And I really don't know where I'm going after this. Okay, got you are a free that out. person. You are a free person, undetermined. Yes. yes, very good. Okay, and then uh, James Herzig. I'm originally from uh, Davenport, Iowa. Okay, where I got my undergrad. Um, I'm in the social department as well. Second year masters, mm -hmm. so hopefully I'll be finishing that up in the next um, little bit. Um, I don't. I want to. Do you want to do a PhD? In yeah, PhD. PhD. Either here, uh -huh. um, probably here, or somewhere else. I don't know yet. Um, and then just, um, yeah, I don't really teach. know what I want to do after that. Probably teach, yeah. do research right. more than teach, but very good. Yeah, teach as well. Wonderful. Okay. My name is Najib Albanadi, I'm from Saudi Arabia, uh -huh. Riyadh. We are too? Yes. Did you know each other before you came mm -hmm. here? No. Uh -huh. we, know, uh, we know each other uh, since we came here. Yeah, right. Uh, I study my undergrad here as, uh, as well, and um, finance major and uh, economics minor. Uh -huh. And I'm doing my master right now in economics. Okay. Um, and when I finish, I think I'm going back home. Uh -huh. yeah. And you will get a job there? Yes. Hopefully. Okay. The king made sure already that you get a job. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sometimes.
sometimes he uh, does not keep his promises. He no, really <laughs> doesn't keep his promises. Yeah. Well, you have to push him. <laughs> push him. Yeah, he doesn't have to. He's the king. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> David. I'm David Thomas from a lifelong student of C Dr. Siebert's. So yeah. Pulled my undergrad out of Western, and ever since I've been uh, on board with. Yeah, and a wonderful uh, friend and a businessman here from Kalamazoo. Yes. Yes. You know, well, born in Muskegon and grew up in Kalamazoo. Yeah. And, and went to Western too, right? Oh yes, oh yes. yes. So. Where this takes me, yeah. we'll see. Very good. Thank you, David. Hockey player too. Yeah, hockey well, player. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, fact. Now, Dustin, you have to introduce yourself once more. Bil <coughs> Arabia or Anglesia? Okay. So, I'm Dustin Bird, uh, or Ismail Abdullah Muhammad. Um, and uh, I did my undergrad at Western in Comparative Religion, my master's at Western in Comparative Religion, and I'm just now finishing up my PhD at uh, Michigan State in uh, Philosophy. And uh, Yeah, it's just written this exam. Wonderful. It's all over there. <laughs> he hasn't read it yet, so he's still saying wonderful. <laughs> 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 I know <laughs> And uh, I teach full-time at Olivet College, where I teach uh, uh, Comparative Religion, Philosophy, Arabic, and History. So. Very good. Now we know each other. Now we can move on. Uh, so you know me, we know each other. Uh, uh, let's say something about the syllabus very shortly. So you all have the syllabus. I gave you one. Well, those who were here the last time. But uh, you two don't have it yet. But who have the syllabus now? Well, you can, you can. I can give that to you here. Who doesn't have any yet? So you can take that. But then you you can share it maybe or it's it, it's big yeah right um, and so and, and you can get it from the you know from the website yeah that's the only one I have so I don't have any anymore okay very good now when you look at the syllabus they have we have the course description right course description and our description is that we want to send and concentrate on Eric Fromm. Um, we said this the last time already, he is a psychoanalyst, uh, he is a social psychologist, and we do have people in our sociology department who teach social psychology. So it is something between psychology and sociology, but it is usually taught in sociology, not in psychology. And of course one is concerned with the individual, the other one is concerned with the, with the society. And the two really belong together. You cannot have an individual without society. That's unbelievable in a liberal society. And you cannot have a society without individuals, neither. So really the two disciplines you know, belong together, really. And social psychology makes the attempt to, uh, to connect that. So uh, Eric Fromm was born in 1900. Uh, he was born in Frankfurt. And that's why the last time I concentrated on my city of Frankfurt, um, it is today a tremendous business city. All the banks are there in which the countries have their accounts. The whole the currency of Croatia is in the Trace Bank, and the whole uh, currency of the Ukraine is in the German bank or whatever. So when I go to a hotel there, I see all these huge bank buildings. The city was completely burned down, well, not completely to 80%. And I was a soldier, and I told them the last time I was in the German Air Force, and I defended Frankfurt and Mannheim and all these cities, but it didn't help very much. So it was burned down, and also the institute in Frankfurt where Fromm worked, and Hockheim and Adorn, it was also burned down, and then later on it was rebuilt again. So it's a new one. Dustin and I, we visited it there, and I go there usually when I go to Frankfurt twice a year, so I may visit there as well. Hanif is the director now of that institute for social research or Frankfurt School. So it is now globalized all over the place and um, most universities have somebody who represents it. <laughs> so then we also want to discuss then uh, uh, the, in the definition there or in this description, course description is our textbook. So we don't have a textbook. That text there course description, A, syllabus, that is our textbook. So it uh, introduces a little bit into uh, Fromm and also into Habermas. He's still alive. Uh, he comes to Northwestern sometimes. He works in Frankfurt. He lives in Bavaria down there. So he's a 
very influential type of a thinker, so we will think uh, to, uh, talk about him. And then his student is the is Hanif Ben. So you have from is the first generation, Habermas is the second one, and Hanif is the third generation, and you are the fourth one. So um, uh, that uh, is somehow what the course description is about. Um, the subtitle of the course description appear again under the discourse names. So the discourse name today, Central Notions and Bombs, you find that already in the course description. So the two things are connected so that you know where we are going to. Okay, that is enough for the moment. Um, the discourse themes, that is under B then on the syllabus. So we have a theme for each of our meeting meetings. Sometimes we have two, we don't have to hold on to them. We can deviate, you can always break in. The more discussion we have, the better it is. But when we don't have discussion, I'm glad to lecture, then you can break in and we have a discussion then. So and there you have the themes. We will never cover all the themes, but it shows you some kind where the railroad is going. Uh, then we have two types of reading here. One is the background reading and we have one reading for a month. So one background reading for a month, and the first background reading is what? You can look it up there. Uh, we follow, we follow, I don't have this syllabus n anymore. So um, I think we, we start with this one. Justin, can you take this below there underneath? Uh, that would be the first reading there. So we have required background reading and we have recommended background reading. So you don't have to do only the required ones, and you can start with the first chapters and so on. Uh, and then, number two, we have a depth study. And we have a whole list where you can choose. You can choose something by Fromm, and you can choose something by Habermas, by Hannes, but you can take others as well. So um, th these are the two. What is the purpose of the two? The background reading introduces us into the method of Fromm and the critical theories. The method is called dialectics. It is a little bit difficult because we don't have dialectics in our universities. We have positivistic universities with protocol sentences, and that is much easier than the dialectical thinking. Dialectical thinking means to think in opposites. So when you talk about religion, you have to talk about the secular as well and how they are connected. So dialectics starts out with uh, dualisms the infinite and the finite, man and uh, individual and collective, and, and so on and so on. And dialectics also wants to resolve these antagonisms. That is important. So positivists very often may ignore those, uh, those contradictions, or they may harmonize them, like Talcott Parsons, for instance, and others. Um, they think they should not be uh, um, thematized because maybe we cannot solve them anyway. So these are the contradictions which you have in that uh, old map there, right? And which I lost some of them, and there they are on the table there. So they are about 58 or whatever, but we could have much more than that. So dualisms for the critical theorists are bad. Dualisms are to be overcome. But the neoliberals also know about these dualisms. For instance, the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, and the workers. But they don't think that these antagonisms are so bad. They think that these antagonisms made us a great nation. So that means the tension there. Like Heraclito says, everything moves, and the war is the father of all things. So war, competition, struggle, and so on. And you hear when McCain comes on, or the, uh, the Fox News, or whatever, they have that. They do not deny that this is the case. They would say, Obama is a socialist, and we are a capitalistic country. So they see the contradiction, even it's not true sometimes. So, but um, they are not interested in resolving it. They think there must be winners and losers. You give an opportunity to the losers, to Western Michigan University, and then they come into the middle class. And if they don't take this opportunity or lose it or whatever, then they go down in the bottom, and it's held down there. Every liberal knows that it is held down there. But who does not work, who does not uh, uh, um, work, should also not live. So you have, it should not eat, and that means you cannot live. So that's what they quote all the time. It's the only thing of Christianity which they have uh, comprehended. Uh, that is from St. Paul letter, letters to the Romans. And um, of course, Jesus said the opposite. Look at the birds; they, uh, you know, they don't work and they eat. Nevertheless, well, Saint Paul 
that is dialectic. The thing is sometimes also called determinate negation. Um, determinate negation means when you have uh, a paradigm change. Let's see, uh, let's see if they from religion, for instance. Let's take Mohammed. Mohammed uh, studied, of course, Judaism, the Hebrew Bible. He studied the New Testament. He met Christians. He met Jews, and so on. And then, then Islam grew out of this. To some extent, Islam negates both of them. Uh, it says that both of them are inspired. Both of them are revelation. But the Jews made a mess of it. They did not obey, really, what Yahweh told them. They did not follow the messengers and so on. And therefore, it has to be re reformed. And the same thing is also with Christianity. Uh, Jesus was a great man, and she was not God, son of God, or son of but he was a great messenger as well. But the Christians did not follow him. They made also a mess of him. They turned upside down whatever he had taught and so on. And therefore, now Islam is the negation of this negation. That is what determinate negation means. It negates Judaism and it negates Christianity, but at the same time also it preserves things. I mean, it preserves that God has spoken through both of them that the norms which God has given, the Decalogue of Moses, is valid, and so on. So um, that is exactly what determinate negation means. It means that something is negated and preserved at the same time and elevated and fulfilled. So in that sense, uh, Islam feels that it is the seal of revelation. It seals what has happened with the Jews and with the Christians. It is the fulfillment of this. That is exactly determinate negation. And if you don't have this method, then you will be very confused about the three Abrahamic religions and about everything else. You'll say they don't have the same God, or whatever. Or you would say that it's the same, it's the same Abrahamic uh, faith, uh, religion, faith community. So, but both is true. It is the same and it is different at the same time. That is again a dialectical expression. And if you are not dialectical, then you will say it's different, they have a different God, and so on and so on. Or you say on the other side the same, and it's not the same, and it's not totally different. That is dialectical thinking, just a tiny little example. And we have the same thing with the, the Buddha negating Hinduism, uh, Luther negating Catholicism, and, and so on. So if we have that word determinate negation, we save ourselves a lot of problems. So, determinate negation or concrete negation or specific negation. Um, you can also transfer it into society. So, socialism, for instance, is the negation of capitalism, of course. So, we talk about um, civil society, of course, that is what Bob and all these people talk about. And um, this civil society uh, has, uh, contains negative elements. It has this antagonism between the rich and the poor and the weight in the salaries and so on go further and further apart and uh, so there's a horrible inequality so in that sense socialism negates what is negative in civil society so um, capitalistic society capitalism means the private appropriation of collective labor that means the owner uh, of this thing there of my cleaning women they come here they do the work the owner sits in Florida and uh, he takes the profit, uh, but the women get their wage. So I pay the women $120, each of the two women gets $10, so, or twenty, let's see, $20, uh, $10 each of them, so $100 surplus value. That is what he gets without doing work, and the women don't get it. That is what's wrong with capitalism. That is what the socialists or the communist or whatever attack. Socialism means the collective appropriation of collective labor. These two leaning women should appropriate all of their work. And it should not go to somebody who doesn't work at all, who doesn't even administer anymore the business or so. So that in every restaurant where you go, it's the same thing. The owner is the guy who, um, uh, he may still work there. And then of course he should get a salary too. But uh, he does not only get his salary if he is, for instance, a cook still, uh, or if he uh, sits at the cashier and gets the money or so, 
but um, he gets also from his girls. He may pay him only 250. The rest should come in an hour. Should come in the tips and so on. So let's see. That, that's the minimum wage for all of them with the tips and so on. It would come up to maybe eight dollars or maybe a little bit more on whatever. But it is only a part of what they produce. So they produce hundred dollars a day, and they maybe get twenty five. Seventy-five dollars is the surplus value. That is why socialism came about, because that is an unhorrible injustice that those who work do not get the whole thing what they have worked for, produced, and that the other one gets it without having produced anything. So, uh, so then we see now that socialism or communism is the negation of capitalism, but it cannot be an abstract concrete, abstract. It cannot be an abstract negation. That happened, for instance, when Kuchov uh, went to the UN and said, we'll bury you. So um, socialism cannot say simply, all of capitalism is bad, or all of the bourgeoisie is bad. When you read Marxist Capital, uh, or when you read the Communist Manifesto, it's better, you'll see there's a whole essay on the greatness of the bourgeoisie, the greatness of capitalism what it has accomplished, and so on. So, um, that means capitalism has to be negated, but it has also to be preserved. Wherever it mobilized the forces of production in terms of invention, industrialization, and so on, science, and the bourgeoisie has done unbelievably great things. The cars in which you came, right, the electricity, yeah, that's all the third estate accomplishments, all bourgeois accomplishments. The airplanes to stay up there, you know, all that is... Uh, and so the, the bourgeoisie, the third estate, was much more uh, productive and creative than the clergy ever was, the first estate, or the nobility ever was. So therefore, there's socialists, real socialists, will recognize that. But then, while it has created these wonderful things, it has also created horrible things. It has created world wars. It has created the gas war. It has produced the atomic bomb. It has bombed two cities and killed and murdered and so on. It takes those little airplanes now without a pilot and assassin people from day to day and so on. So that is the other side. It's not the good side of slaveholder society which makes it come to its end. It's not the good side of feudalism uh, which, uh, which makes it move. It is the negative which moves, namely these people in the slums. 40 million in the slums. Today, again, or yesterday, they denied the uh, 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 unemployment compensation money for one and a half million, another one and a half million. That means these people go out to the mailbox there, and that thing is not there for the month there. And they should, should look for jobs. How can they look for jobs if they have no gasoline? And if they don't have a cheeseburger to eat, which you need in order to go out there into the cold and find something inside. So there you see the horrible thing. And that is happening in the Congress because we have no Labour Party. We are the only country without a Labour Party. England has a Labour Party. Canada has a Labour Party. The Germans have social democrats. The Danish, the Norwegians, and so on. We don't have that. If we had a Labour Party, that could never happen. If we had a Labour Party, they could never have stopped the food stamps. They ought to have stopped. They could never have uh, uh, denied uh, these uh, four million people or whatever they are unemployment compensation and so on. Uh, they would never give in like the Democrats do. It's another bourgeois party. They are, we are only two capitalist parties. So th there is no unemployment compensation because the Democrats caved in a few weeks ago and said we want to get that through there and so we give that up. And, and now they don't have it. So uh, this is the bourgeois party which did, did this. So no matter how different you know people are, the neoliberals and the Obama, the Roosevelt liberals, and so on. These are tiny little differences in comparison to a real opposition, in the socialistic opposition, and they have repressed it. They were successful for 200 years and kept it out. That's why we don't have health insurance. Yes, it's by Germany in 1870. But the interesting thing, in Germany, a conservative party, and a statesman, Bismarck, introduced it so that the socialists wouldn't do it. So the socialists were sitting in parliament and they threatened to do it. So then the conservatives said, we take the wind out of their sails. And so the conservatives do it. So even if we had a 
the Labour Party, and it would not be strong enough or whatever, the bourgeois parties would at least be frightened that they will do it if we don't do it or so. So that was also during the Cold War. <laughs> the capitalists had to be very careful because there was this other possibility that socialism, that Germany would become socialistic if we don't give them the Marshall Plan and so on. But now, since this has been removed to some extent, capitalists are doing whatever they want to. And then you see that, that they cut the food stamps and so on because they feel there's no opposition. So, uh, Harry Plato's, you know, is the great philosopher of becoming. Uh, Hegel became the Heraclitus of the 19th century, and so did Marx. So they think, you know, that um, everything flows, nothing remains static forever, and then what moves it all? It is the war. So one is Pantare, everything flows. The other one is Polymorphs, Pantare, Pantone. The war, Polymorphs, Polemics, and so on. The war is the father of all things. Now, there are innumerable definitions and types of wars, of course. So there is the violent and nonviolent side. So it means that conflict, conflict, struggle moves things forward. And so if you want to move forward in this country, we have to struggle. And we have to struggle that the 250 million workers will be represented, that they will not be disenfranchised, as it is the case now. Uh, you see, sometimes, you know, there is a bourgeois creep there, a democratic representative or senator. And he says, I want to live on food stamps now a week. So he lives a bourgeois existence. He doesn't even know what food stamps is. So he's a good-hearted guy, bl bl bloody, bloody hard uh, liberal there. He goes then and for a week, and he cannot. He cannot live on it and so on. Or he'll sit there a month being unemployed or whatever. So, but they have to make this acrobatics because they don't know how the 250 live, million live. Not to speak how the people live on the north side. Please drive through there, that's your assignment. Uh, to go on the other side of the railroad station and drive around there a little bit, what that looks like. And you have that in Flint, and you have it in Grand Rapids, and you have it in Washington, and Baltimore, and so on. Every city has that. And then you have, beside the urban uh, 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 slums, you have the country slums all over the place. We are sometimes worse than, than the urban ones. <laughs> okay, so, but the first important now it was the idea of dialectics. If the socialists would say we negate uh, capitalism abstractly, they would make a great mistake, because no class can recreate the world from the beginning. They have to stand on the shoulders of those whom the sun sent. So the feudal lords stood on the shoulders of the slaveholders, the capitalists on the shoulders of the feudal lords, and uh, then uh, whatever comes next, socialism or communism or whatever, will have to stand on the shoulders of the bourgeoisie. They will negate, they will be critical, but they will also preserve. They will somehow complete what the bourgeoisie promised and didn't do. The bourgeoisie promised material freedom, but they advocate the freedom for the ruling class to do whatever they want to. There's no brotherhood, there's no equality, there's no social justice, etc. All that was promised by the Third Estate when they made the revolution in England and in France and so on, but they betrayed it all. So therefore the socialists will have to take up those bourgeois ideals and will finally complete them. So it is not only a preservation, it's also an elevation and a completion of what the bourgeoisie has betrayed. For 200 years they became richer and richer and never were they able to remove the slums. In some uh, bourgeois countries, small ones like Switzerland, they were able to do, to do that, and uh, also in Sweden and, and so on, maybe in Denmark as so. well. Um, in Canada, in Toronto, you cannot see the slums. They are nicely kept, and they are beside the rich, they are also the slum house, but they don't look like slum house anymore, and so on. In New York, you don't have tenement houses anymore, which were these caves, these hells, into which they put millions and millions of people the whole 19th century. Now they have projects. Projects are huge skyscrapers, and they cannot see anymore how poverty stricken it is from outside. Okay, so that is important, uh, and we want to learn that method by the background reading. So that would be the first background reading, and when you read that, you'll see it uses the dialectical method. The first chapter is on the dialectical method. <laughs> you may not use it later on in your life, but it is good that you know there is another way from the way your teachers taught you. So all your teachers are positivists, whatever they are in economics or 
sociology and so on, um, we had dialectical thinking in this country. But then the Great Depression came of 29 and 39, and then we thought it would destabilize people. They would suddenly think in terms of movement. They would turn in terms of struggle, uh, driving the movement and so on. And we thought they shouldn't be uh, destabilized in their head while the whole economy wasn't stabilized outside. And so then it was, it was a cultural decision which we made and we paid an unbelievable price for this in terms of our internal situation, but particularly to see the military one. Wherever we uh, had to face the dialectician on the other side of general, we lost the war. General Giap in, in, uh, in, in Vietnam uh, was, a, uh, was a student of the Russian dialectician who won the war against uh, uh, Stalingrad, which is now World War One. Well, last week there was this attack, the terror attack in, in uh, Stalingrad or Volgograd now. So um, the German general was, a, was a, a, a positivist and he got utterly confused by, by his opponent. And the Russians trained also the Ba'ath ba Party in, in Iraq and there we, we, we didn't accept them and we pushed them in the underground and then they became the opposition and you know that the war has started again. Uh, in Iraq now, the, the old cities where Americans died in order to conquer it, fall back into Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda, which wasn't even there, they were not even there under Saddam Hussein, uh, and but now they are there, and uh, they have the same dialectical tactic: you attack, you withdraw, you change your theory, and with the change theory, you attack again, and when you withdraw, the other think you they have won and uh, then suddenly there comes the Tet Offensive and suddenly they are in the middle of Saigon and so on. So uh, that is dialectical warfare and wherever you have a positivistic general he can have ten times more airplanes or whatever, he will still lose. Because wars, as animal-like as they look, they are, you have to think in wars and the one who thinks better will win, no matter what material he has. So. <laughs> that is one price which we paid, but in number of other things. And um, the, uh, the bourgeoisie here wants to stabilize the whole thing, and they don't want people to think in dynamic terms. So the Parsons developed a whole wonderful system, static system. The students asked, uh, pushed him then that he would put the social change part to it, but he did, but it didn't really come through, and so and so. That's also not their interest. For 30 years he worked on statics, and that is usually what you what you read. The positivists are people who um, uh, deny all metaphysics. That's a kind of strange word again. Metaphysics is a Greek word. Meta means beyond something, and physics. It's beyond physics, so it's beyond bodies and so on. So um, all other civilizations had some kind of a metaphysics. That means people in their personal reason were able to discover an objective outside there. Uh, at least their thinking people could do that, their teachers. And sometimes they told people about this objective rationality in terms of religious images and stories, stories like Sodom and Gomorrah and so on. So if you violate this objective rationality then you will go under the story of Lot or the story of, uh, of the flood or whatever. It does not matter if, um, if the positivists they want to know what the Ark of Noah is or whatever, that nobody's really a religious person were ever interested in that. The issue is that the story shows that there were people whose subjective reason or intersubjectivity was not in touch with the objective reason in the family, in society, in the state, in religion, and so on, that there were abstractions moving between their subjective reason and this objective rationality, and that therefore they could not see it, and therefore they then began to act uh, pervert in perverse ways, and this perverse thing then uh, destroyed the city-state, uh, or unleashed nature, and nature destroyed the city-state. But it could not have been destroyed if people had not been perverse in the first place. Perverse in the sense that the subjective reason fell off, separated itself from the objective reason and had was unable to make contact. So the, anti the antagonism between the subjective reason, which is in all of us, and then the objective reason 
out there which is given and which we don't make up, which we have not invented. We, uh, our body is given to us. The form, the assimilation process, the, the, the genus process, population process, and so on. All that is given, we have not made that up. And so, on. so, but we either see the rational structure of it and act according to it, or we are blinded by abstractions. Porno, for instance, is very abstract. That means you look only at the sexual part of the other person, or the prostitute only looks at the money of the guy, which he abstracts from everything else that he is married, that he has children, or whatever or that she has a sister and has to do that for her mother uh, in order to feed her or whatever. So this one is concrete. Concrete means in Latin concrete, so to grow together. Uh, uh, different details are growing together to a whole. So um, people cannot think holistically anymore. They cannot think of the family as a whole, of the state as a whole, etc., of the civil society as a whole. So that is uh, maybe fundamental antagonism between the subjective rationality and the objective rationality. Now, we will also be critical of the critics. So when we look at the Frankfurt School people, they are post-Hegelian, post-metaphysical people. Habermas talked about this, and he was attacked for that. <laughs> that means uh, even when you change, as Habermas and Hannes do, from the subject uh, philosophy, as we had it before, uh, which is dealing with the human subject idealistically and so on, so even when they change over into the paradigm of intersubjectivity now, that means we have to come to an agreement with each other what is right or what is rational and so on. Even then there is no guarantee that one breaks through, that all of them break through, to the rationality in the things themselves, in my body, in my family, in the state, and so on. So that people come to an agreement does not mean that they have reached the rational structure of things. So it is part of that one state after the other, for instance, allows gay marriage. Uh, so then they have an intersubjective consensus, a majority decision. But there is still the question if this majority decision is really objective or not because it's just another broader subject. Now, they all agree now, yes, we have that. And then a few months later, they cancel it again. And then a few months later, then they say, yes, it's, uh, it's okay, and so on. But um, the, the, the weakness which we can see already in the Frankfurt School is if they think that to move from the individual subject to a collective subject or intersubjectivity and consensus and so on, even that consensus may still be separated from the rationality as it is in things themselves. So I grew up in, in a country, uh, in, in fascist Germany, and the majority was wrong. But they had a consensus, so this is a, it's a genius, and we have to colonize Russia, and, and so on and so on. It was all wrong. So um, the, the, there is no guarantee that intersubjectivity will break through to that objective. That would be metaphysics. Now, positivism is the negation of all metaphysics. This country has no metaphysics. It never had any metaphysics. The civil society, American civil society, has no metaphysics. That means there are individuals who are talking with each other, and they come to a certain agreement, and then they make their laws. And these positivistic laws, that's all they have. There is no thing how you can measure if this positivistic law is really true or not. Um, that means there is no natural law, as the Arabs had it, for instance, Averroes and so on, had uh, objective uh, rationality. And uh, so the, the, the Christians had it, also with Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas and uh, Averroes. They had connection with each other. And they both were still metaphysicians. That means their subjective rationality could break through to the objective one. That is all gone in this society. That is where the confusion comes from, you know. That suddenly the president says, you know, I had some kind of uh, enlightenment in the last months, and so we have now gay marriage from now on. And another one may come in, he doesn't have that enlightenment and whatever, and, and he will do the opposite. It's a, that produced unbelievable chaos uh, among people. 
but it is in general, this is the most extreme of all civil societies. A civil society, liberal society, liberalism is atomization, at atomistic, like Protestantism is. So liberalism comes from Calvinism, and Protestantism was already very atomistic, emancipated individual, I believe, my God, what does my God say, and so on. My God says something else, and your God says, and so on, and so on. So that is an insane asylum. But um, the, now we can say, ironically now, that positivism itself is a metaphysics, which denies all other metaphysics, but it is the metaphysics of what is the case the facts and the data. That is what they posit as uh, some kind of reality. That is the reality, and you have to conform to this reality, and then you are healthy, and, and, and so on and so on. So, so positivism is the non-metaphysics, or the metaphysics of, the, of what is the case, what are the data, what are the facts, and so on. And there is no thing where one can see that maybe a fact or data or datum is maybe an appearance. So the separation of appearance and the essence of things. So for instance, uh, when I go to Lake Michigan, I say, oh, look how beautiful the sun sets. I know that's the appearance, but essentially it's different. It's the earth on which I sit which moves and not the sun and so on. Uh, but since 400 years we know that, but still people hold on to the appearance. And now in terms of society, there is the issue of necessary appearance. So the anchor man and these heads which are talking there, they produce a necessary appearance all day long. That means uh, when something bad happens, you know, we had that before, and so on. So they try to normalize things all the time so that people feel good, and they hide things, and, uh, and, and so on, in order to be millions of dollars for this uh, necessary appearance. This necessary appearance is called an ideology. We talked about it the last time, <coughs> because it was in my trailer there. So ideology, well, as your teachers take it, is a combination of ideas and values. Learn mathematics, and you will make a lot of money yourself. It's, it's relatively harmless. Ideology also means um, to identify a cause for something which happens. So my son was a lawyer in New York. We went to, to uh, Yalta together, and we had discussions, and uh, we talked about the poor in, in New York, masses, the millions of poor. And so he said, well, they don't have the, uh, the work ethics. They don't have the positive work ethics. That means they are lazy. They are irresponsible and so on. They are, don't want to work and so on. Uh, that is ideology, right? That is bourgeois ideology. Since the bourgeoisie was never able to uh, do away with the slums, then they say it's not the fault, not our fault, it's not the fault of the bourgeois society. It's the fault of those damaged crooks there who cannot get up in the morning, who don't take the beautiful opportunities which we give them all the time. Instead of that, they sit there and they drink and they don't work and they are welfare, welfare people and they are dependent and they want to be dependent. And if you give them food stamps and they don't work because the food stamps are more worth than what they could work, the minimum wage is too low, so there is no incentive and so on and so on. That is all ideology. So there is ideology in the positivistic sense, which is harmless, but then there is also ideology in the critical sense. Then it is false consciousness, it is uh, the masking of class interests, and the class, the bourgeois class interest, and it goes so far that, for instance, the owner class tells people that there are no owners. So I'm discussing that, you know, with all kinds of people, like Socrates, I'm walking around the streets and <laughs> ask people, you know, if they're owners, so what that means. Now, you know, the, obviously the cleaning women have an owner who takes the surplus value from them. And I go to the thing there, the uh, colonial kitchen, where you're all invited, by the way, every Saturday at 12.30 we meet there and you get a free lunch, you get part of your tuition back, so that's very good. <laughs> and then you get A++ plus plus and you go to heaven even. So, this, uh, so the, the, there it's quite clear who is the owner. The daughter of the owner appears there all the time, so there's no doubt. But they don't belong to 
the ruling class, that's the low middle class, so there is no interest, so they, they all say that's okay. Now my lawyer has 60 people employed, yeah. and he of course calls himself the owner. He invested his pension into that, and now he employs them, he is the owner, and he gets the profit, and so on. The owner gets the profit, the stockholders get the dividends, and the uh, the white collars get the salary and the blue collars get the wages. So, so, but now when it goes up there, where the real ruling class is, there's something strange happens now. So, and I say, who owns this oil company? Who owns the car company? So Ford, the family Ford. So they are still there. But then suddenly something very strange happens. Namely, they say, oh, well, the stockholders become the owners. They go even so far to say that the owner of an oil company, when he goes public, gives up his ownership and becomes his own stockholder, maybe over 50%, and then he gives, gives the influence or whatever. That a capitalistic owner would voluntarily give up his ownership is so unbelievable that one doesn't know how anybody believes it. But when I say to my children or so, I say, you know, who owns the thing factory or the, uh, the uh, thing there which you work for, this corporation and so on, is the stockholders. And that means that there is no owner. And if there is no owner, then they are not owned. And then we are really a free country. But it has only happened in the head. It hasn't happened in reality. In reality, of course, the owners are there. Maybe it's one family or it's a group which is not related by blood or whatever. Um, now the owners, uh, the, the, the stockholders do own something. The stocks they own. So my mother-in-law had stocks in the movie theater. She never owned the movie theater, but she did own the stocks. And she could pull out the stocks, she did. And nothing happened to the movie theater. It didn't lose its owner because she left or whatever. It still had the same owner. So it is relatively easy, you know, to see and to trace that back, how that stock stuff developed first, not too long ago, uh, beginning of modernity. So a guy in Lisbon wanted to send a ship to America, and so he needed money to pay the people on the ship uh, to do the work and to get that ship over to South America, and there they would uh, let the Indians uh, dig gold there, steal the gold, and bring it back again. So. He goes to his friends and says, uh, you know, I have the ship, but I cannot pay the crew. Uh, can you give me $100? So everybody gives him $100. He pays the crew, and he says, you get $150 back when the ship comes back. And so the ship goes over, it comes back, and he gives $50 more uh, to everybody who gave him that loan. So, um, and so they have, they own that stock then all the time. But at no moment in the whole process did they own the ship. And there you see something, intelligent people make that up in their head because it makes them feel bad when you say they're owners because then it's not a free country. Now Fox News tells you every country has a ruling class. <laughs> It's uh, very strange that the most extreme right-wing people, some who are lying a lot, but they do sometimes say the truth. You know, they smell the rat in a certain sense. So, uh, so they would say we all have a ruling class, and the ruling class, the owner class. But uh, uh, Bush now he would say we are a country of owners. Now, even if the stockholders would be the owners, there may be 12 million, 15 million people who have stocks. Then we would have 15 percent ruling class. But the stockholders are not the ruling class. The ruling class are the ones who really own that thing. And they have to go to court. Pfizer there, the owners, not the stockholders. But the owners have to go to court because the federal government has charged them with having produced a painkiller which kills people and thereby, of course, also the pain. But this is not a good way to do it. So, therefore, they have to pay $3 billion in punishment, probably, now, the stockholders may be impacted by that, of course. If the stock may go down because of that miserable medicine or whatever. That's another thing, right? But the court will not call the stockholders in. The court will call the owners in and their representatives and their lawyers, etc. 
It's also not the the uh, the, the coop there which appears there uh, the, the up up there and seems to make decisions or whatever. So um, because the capitalist separates himself more and more from the work as he is successful. So uh, my the, the the people there in the colonial kitchen they still have to be there. You know they, they just uh, take the money and whatever. But the uh, other things, the um, cleaning women, there the owner has already separated himself from the whole cleaning operation and the administration. He does not call me anymore when they cannot come. It is another one whom he put into the office, and so who is employed by him, and so, so But that is ideology now, and it is very tough, and it is necessary up here. That means it is necessary for the whole damaged thing to function. You want to say something? Oh, no, I just, what you're saying is uh, definitely ringing true. It seems it seems like what we need to do in order to kind of, you know, break through that veil of false consciousness is kind of change terminology. So I think the word owner, yeah. as you're describing it, it no longer applies. It's, it sounds more like what we're talking about is you have people who have little bits and pieces and then people who control. Yeah. And the controller would be a better well, way yeah. talking about. But, I mean, the, the owners do control, oh, yeah. you know, the whole thing. But I think that's when you, you have people who own stock, you know, they don't really have any control yeah. you know, well, over what goes on. They, they have another thing, of they have some kind of a package which you can have and then you do control, you know, or they, they have the feeling that they control. Yeah. Right? So, um, and it's just that false yeah. sense. Yeah. Right, right. So, but, you know, to hold on to that old word there and what has happened to them, and I'm not entirely clear yet, you know, what that looks like. So the most powerful corporations are the oil corporations, you know, and um, how they are really, uh, who owns or is responsible for it, you know, who has control over the whole thing, because the control has to be based in something, you know. Well, corporations so are interesting because it's, it's really it's a group of owners. Well, it could, it's could multiple people who own multiple yeah. things in you yeah. know, right. different yeah. places, so it's well, a and hard thing to say. The same owner may own, you know, different uh, corporations and mm -hmm. different branches of production, and so the bigger you get, the more you buy them up. And so, but uh, see, the feudal lord was visible all the time. So he had a castle. He came out of the castle on his horse, and he had a coat of arms, you know, and a little flag on the back of the horse, you know, and so everybody knew that was the lord, you know. The slaveholder down in the uh, slave places there, they knew that the guy is who the guy is and in charge and such. So, but with us, you know, the Upjohn people, there was a little Upjohn lady who, whose name is on some of those buildings. She did not appear really. She was in the Volkswagen and she had a little tennis shoes on and so on. So, <laughs> and that you don't see them, you know, although you cannot get into their country clubs. It's too expensive and so on. So, and what they talk in there, you know. This fellow, the candidate for the Republicans there, Omni, um, he talked in a country club like that, and, and the waiter what left the microphone on, and he suddenly talked about 47% are dependents and uh, welfare loafers. And so that was not supposed to get out. Uh, so they talk, have their own language in there, and they know, you know, that the, the, the Noah day is coming, and they want to get out of the whole thing as much as possible, as long as they can. And so, so but. Of course, if you hide, you know, it's harder to do something uh, to you. So then they may say, you know, when you get health insurance for a few more million people, you say that is socialism. But that's not yet socialism, you know. Socialism would be the removal of that owner class. And one way how they prevent the removal is by saying that they're not there. <laughs> it's a fantastic type of a thing, you know. So a revolution is what the Civil War. The Civil War was a revolution, right? The capitalistic ruling class of the North annihilated the Southern slaveholder class without residuals. And they did that, you know, in order to, for a more perfect union, uh, in order to rescue the union, and maybe also accidentally by freeing the slaves, but it took another 50 years until they were free. But the main purpose was that there could not be two ruling classes in the same thing, though the whole country would have split. Uh, and uh, the two parts would have been under a different ruling class, and they would have made a war later on. And so, so, <coughs> so this uh, that is a good example. You know the other things which come in. You know the civil war. Um, it's, it can be a good uh, paradigm or 
a good example to explain a lot of things to Americans. I went just to Gettysburg and had a wedding there, and I went to the battlefields for hours and hours and looked at the different positions and so on. So because that was the decisive, the decisive battle in which the only class of the North then annihilated the Southern uh, only class. So, but also that people on both sides, you know, went into the battle with this ideology of sacrificial death, that you had to sacrifice, individual had to sacrifice his life for his country and for the union and so on, and then that they would that you would get to heaven by that, you know, that the army guys, the um, preachers, told them that, you know, only when you sacrifice your life, you're a hero, and also only when you're a hero, you will go to heaven. Does that remind you of the jihadists? It's the same same thing, right? And and um, the interesting thing is that this ideology that the individual has to sacrifice himself in a holy death or whatever, you know, is so powerful that when you look at a guy like Hitler, who went through four years of unbelievable suffering, he went between the uh, leaders of the army, the generals, and the front line. He had to go back and forth, and he got two iron crosses for unbelievable sang- uh, 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 privacy, uh, privacy uh, uh, no, fortitude or whatever. And um, so he saw his comrades, you know, in, there were different some battles, battles at the Somme River, and with thousands of artillery pieces shooting and shooting for hours and hours, you know, before they stormed and so on. And he saw that, you should think that somebody who did this would come out and would be a pacifist and would say, that must never happen, or whatever. But it didn't happen. He came out and made another one, in which he used the same mythology, the same ideology, the wonderful thing to sacrifice yourself for your country, and so on, and and took three million people with him, and killed 27 million people, and lost in Stalingrad, you know. A whole army, a sixth army, and so on, and was never moved in any way. So powerful that is. Not only that one guy, it's all those who came with him again. Twenty years after they suffered all that, they went into the same thing again. So um, there you see something which, which is more than local, you know. It, it happened in the Civil War, but it happened in thousands of other wars again and again and again. It happens in Iraq now again, you know. It happens in Afghanistan again, and so on. So, and, and tomorrow it will happen somewhere else. You cannot make people into pacifists. Why can you make them into pacifists? because they have this ideology in their head that there is something holy about sacrificing yourself, your bodily self, and that you will be rewarded then. You will go to heaven for this, you know. And there are always enough army chaplains who will do this, you know. To the extreme, a Catholic priest puts holy water on the two bombs which were thrown into Hiroshima, you know, and killed 70,000 people in each place, you know, and so on. So, well, he did, you know, convert later on. He said he was brainwashed by the army, and then he became a fighter for, he became a pacifist in, in the end, you know, for, for later in his life. <laughs> but it doesn't happen to the masses of the people. Okay, so that is important. We have these two readings, right? One book a month, uh, background reading, and another one which you choose, a depth study. That depth study is not so much concerned with the, uh, uh, with the form or with the method anymore, but it tells you about the content now, right? And there you can take Hanif or Habermas or Form and so on. I can tell you uh, Form is easier to read, you know, than Habermas or Hanif. Um, but Hanif and uh, Habermas are easier to read than Adorno, for instance, or, or Benjamin or whatever, and so on. Um, it depends on the degree, degree of dialectics which people use. And when you see something difficult when you read, don't think that it has something to do with your IQ. It has something to do with the method which is used in the text. And if you read a positivistic text, it will be easier. If you read a dialectical text, it will become more difficult. It's not your fault. It's the fault of the text. Okay. Now, as far as text is concerned, we uh, want to uh, maybe have one in the first week of each month. So. The first one in February, the second one in March, the third one in April, and uh, you can take it home, so you can do, do it at home. And um, we will do two things. You can either have a test where you have questions, I give you questions, 
or you can write a paper about your depth study and your background reading, so you can sum it up and so on instead of the questions. So you have that choice. I give you both. I give you the questions, and then um, two, one question is on the background reading, one on depth study. You can take those two questions out, leave all the questions out, and then just sum up what you have read. You also don't have to read all the chapters, right? You go as far as you can. You have other things to do, right? And uh, so um, if it's more difficult, then you have to read slower, and that means you may only have two or three chapters. If it's easier, you can have more. So I will not, um, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you get through the whole book. Okay, so that is the test and grading. Uh, each time when we meet here, you get a grade for your all participation. When you are quiet and consuming, then you get a B. When you say something, then you get an A. When you are not here, you get an F. So just see that you don't have too many Fs. So that would be good. Um, then uh, there is a th then the three um, tests that will be graded. And then you can, in the end, write an extra credit paper. Um, if you think, you know, you want to get your all participation grade up, um, then you can take the background reading, one of the three background readings, and write about that and uh, make a short, you know, writing. So that is uh, then objectives there. Though you can see then the syllabus, what we want to achieve in that discourse, but we are not really bound to do that. And then there is something about academic honesty, that one, you know, should have plagiarism, that you write what the other does. But it's possible that two or three people work together, and then it looks a little bit similar, and I, I wouldn't be you know, too worried about that, right? So um, that is possible. Okay, and then there is the roadmap. And let me just look at this roadmap very shortly there. You, so you have it all, so that Let's just look at this, but before I go there, uh, is there any question which you have uh, about what I've said so far? Um, you always want to stop, and you can stop me and whenever you want to. Um, is there anything what you would like to ask about what i said so far? Okay, now um, let me explain a little bit what that means here. So you have the first page there, Critical Theory of Religion, Fundamental Potentials, Categories and Spheres of Action. So um, the Critical Theory of Society, you know, that is the embracing concept. Um, Fromm came into that in Frankfurt, and uh, together with others, and with Horkheimer and Adorno and Marcuse and so on, they are all critical theorists of society. They are all sociologists. They are also at the same time philosophers. They're also psychologists at the same time. So they took in Marx and they took in Freud and many other scholars before. So uh, historical materialism and also the classical idealism before. So it is a very rich and very concrete and very powerful type of a, of a theory. Right? And uh, they have influenced positivists and, and so on all over the country in psychology and in sociology and anthropology and so on. Okay, so, but now here you have the whole structure there. So you have a world of nature, the internal world, the social world, the cultural world, and the world of language. Now there is something here, there is a little arrow there up there which says nature. When you take it as it is here, then that is what modern people, how modern people look at it, enlightened people and so on. Now when you have traditional people, they would not be happy with this because, particularly for the uh, three uh, um, monotheistic religions, because they have God, nature, and man. And what you have here is only nature and man. So the arrow there means that there may be something before nature. The God who created the world, you know, as the Genesis says in the, in the Hebrew Bible, and then we have it in the New Testament, and we have uh, John, you know, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and everything was created through the Word, and so on. That is all before that. When you have modern people, positivists or naturalists, 
A naturalist is somebody who takes nature as the foundation, and there is nothing before that. If he is an atheist, he will say, we know that there is nothing before that. If he is an agnostic, he says, we may, there may be something for it, but we don't know it with the method of sociology or anthropology or whatever. We cannot say anything if there is anything before. And when we don't know anything but before, we also don't know anything what is in the future or whatever. Because the same God who creates the world also then aims at its redemption of the kingdom of God and so on.
6,000 years have abstracted from nature and now they throw it into the beginning and then they talk about the Logos, the Word of God, and so on and so on. Right? So this is not our theme here because we are not in the religion department. We are in the sociology department. So, And the sociologists, like the natural scientists, they want to imitate the natural scientists. They have no metaphysics. So they, most of your teachers are agnostics. They are not really atheists. And when I taught in Eastern Europe, uh, many of these atheists, their communists, have become agnostics as well. Agnostics is, is a more a fair way to deal with it because the atheist would really be certain that, that there is nothing before that. But there is no scientific way to say this um, because the, the, all the methods are there finite and finite methods cannot say anything about the infinite. So there cannot be any scientific atheism. There cannot be any scientific theism neither. And particularly since the first great uh, modern philosopher, uh, one of them at least, Kant, he would say that one cannot, science cannot enter the sphere of God and immortality and freedom and so on. It must stay in the finite sphere. And then he opened up, he was a Lutheran, he opened up the sphere of faith then. There is room for faith. And uh, he would say that um, ethics and so on, that these are postulates. We have to, we don't know anything about God or uh, freedom and in, uh, on immortality, but we have to postulate, we have to assume it if we want to live a human life and not a chimpanzee life or car, a sex car in Korea. So, so um, that uh, is going, this I uh, thinking is going up to Habermas and the liberals, uh, liberal thinkers in, in this country as well. So Kant plays an important role for Habermas and, and uh, also for Hannes besides Hegel. Okay, so then we have nature up there and the, the mechanical realm, the Big Bang and so on, the physical mechanical realm and the biosphere. Um, so that would be, would be in nature and so on. Then of course the scientist goes very much into detail and studies every little detail of the Big Bang, you know, which about 14 billion years ago and he pushes the time out further and further because there was something before the bang and then they get into that what's called the bad infinity, not the good infinity like God, but a bad infinity. It goes on and on and on. There's no end forward and backward, and that's a disastrous sociology in a certain sense because it means, you know, that human society is just a little circus which comes out of the dark, put down their tents, jump around on the on the walls there and then close it all up again and go into the dark. They come from the dark and go into the dark. And uh, that is, of course, post-metaphysical. When you do away with all metaphysics, it just gets dark. <coughs> okay, then one part of nature is, of course, the human organism, our form and assimilation, both eating, drinking, seeing, theoretical, practical, etc. And then the genus process, the sexual process, and, uh, and these are all totalities in themselves, so and the scientists can study again every little detail of that. Scientists are people who are looking for the trees, and uh, sometimes they lose, the, lose the, the forest, and then people come and say, we have to be holistic, we have to see the whole thing again. And then we have general studies, right? General studies uh, is against specific studies. They say we also have to see the whole, but general studies, you know, is a very strange type of a thing. We had, inside of general studies, we had get it together group. We tried to get it together because general studies didn't get it together. Then my friend Lindner, a great man from Europe, came and said, you cannot have general studies, we have specific studies. And, and so it's, we, we dissolved the school, there was a school of general studies, and uh, put it back to the departments, which means, of course, specific studies again. And, so, so it's a horrible confusion. What that means is we are very good at the trees and the details and so on, but then the whole thing gets lost. And so to could balance this, general studies is a good idea. It came up in, after the Second World War, but it doesn't work yet. Okay, and then we have where human subjectivity begins. So the idea is that we are chimpanzees. Uh, we have almost the same genome a few percentages different, right? They are much closer to us than they are to the orangutans, you know. So, um, and somewhere, uh, maybe, uh, um, how long? Uh, uh, we 
don't know exactly, let's see, it's one and a half million or two million years ago, maybe it was a little bit longer, we separated from them. And out of the forest in the savannah, we started to go upright, just very hard, and so it's so, so millions of years until that worked. And uh, so what we really know a little bit better, you know, is about 6,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, that is when we have, we can find, you know, tools and, and we can uh, also have uh, documents and be, people begin to write and, and so on. So uh, when you think of thinking and higher religions and so on, it's only 6,000 years ago. Or Mesopotamia and Egypt and India and China, these are the four great civilizations and they come about only by 3,000, 2,000 or so. I mean, it was just yesterday, you know. So when you think this unbelievable dark time, you know, without leaderships, without names, without proper names, Hans first of all, or whatever, um, nations had no names, tribes had no names, nothing, you know, it was just a quanting type of a language or whatever, and that went on for, for thousands and thousands of years. So um, it's important to, to get also the background picture because the critical theorists, unlike many parts of it, have not canceled history. So. Um, Max Weber still has a lot of history, you know, and uh, so, <laughs> but more recently the historical dimension got lost and the philosophical dimension got, uh, got lost. And what we want to try, we want to not allow the impoverishment of the social sciences which has happened. So, you know, there's, there's something, uh, you know, there's a, there's a science of uh, a theory about human subjectivity and uh, the anthropological level, phenomenological level. And there come five human potentials which are very important uh, for us here. Uh, it is the potential of uh, uh, language and memory and struggle for recognition, which Habermas and Hannes have uh, emphasized particularly, and that goes back to form to a large extent. And then they have left out work and tool. Marx concentrated on that, and sometimes they leave out sex, and Freud uh, has emphasized this too. So, and then nationhood, that's where the nationalists, like Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, Sarasa, Petrovich, and, 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 and of course the, the uh, Reagan and so on. Um, that is a very powerful potential because it includes the other. You speak the language of your country, you uh, reproduce your country economically, sexually, and so on. So that is when, when you have those nationalists and they push a button that everybody shouts, Heil, 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 and all this. And then the psychological level, that would be memory in us, which plays such an important role in Judaism but in Islam and so on too. If the memory goes, these religions you lose their basis. And then the intellect and uh, the will, uh, but not only instincts or so, but the will which is mediated by intellect, or intellect which is mediated by will. That's the psychological level. And here is, of course, then where could if these follow Freud, and we have to see how Freud and, and the older thinkers like Aristotle and Hegel and so on, how, how that connects, and there are more connections than one usually knows. And then comes the whole ethical world, you know, the poverty and contract and justice, private right and personal morality, and uh, then the family, and then comes civil society. That is, of course, the main thing which they are concerned with. So. There is a family study from participating in Marcuse in Hockheimer made an early study on the family and the authoritarian personality, authority in the family and so on. But the main thing is civil society. Marx concentrated on this too. And civil society is the need system, administration of justice, police and professional organization. So that will come up here again and again. And different from that is the state, constitutional state. So you have the bourgeois in civil society, you have the citizen in the constitutional state, and that we don't mix that up. Americans mix that up. They think if a businessman makes a lot of profit, he will also be a good statesman. Suddenly they have all these governors who are businessmen, of course, make a mess of it, because it's a completely different rationality at work in the state than it's at work in civil society, and therefore it doesn't work really, and Detroit gets bankrupt and whatever. So and then there's the dimension of history there, and uh, then the dimension of art and religion and philosophy and science, and then the language. So uh, when you have those words, you know, that uh, then you have something to hold on to, and we will come back to this and repeat it again and again and define it and so on. 
Then there's the second page B, and we don't have to go into this because we are not in the religion department here, but these are the various religions which we discuss in the religion department. And then you have these antagonisms, religion and secular, and nature and man, and matriarchal and patriarchal, and so on. And it doesn't matter how many you have there, and if some got lost, I'm, I'm sorry about this, I printed it out and the, I got confused, so the machine got it confused. So let's play the machine, let's put it on the machine, that's good. And then you have in the end then, the last page, that is future ideas there. So uh, uh, you could say that the critical theory contain, uh, contains a futurology, but there is a man of the flesh time whom I met in Dubrovnik, and a uh, little man who developed this uh, critical futurology. So there are three alternatives. One is administered society. What is that? If you see a picture uh, of Toronto or Frankfurt or New York with the skyscrapers, and then you see nine lanes of cars moving into the thousands of cars and so on, that is the administered society. And then one guy, one governor, you know, like Christie and so on, just is angry and stops the whole thing over the pitch. <laughs> and they all have to sit there for five hours and so on. So he can administer this thing, you know. So that is the totally administered society. And then we have the entirely militarized society. Think of our unbelievable military budget, you know. Since before Napoleon already... Uh, just to conquer a few islands became suddenly awfully expensive and from Napoleon on these, uh, these war debts and are, are just staggering because of the weapon technology and so on. So from the budget you can see, you know, that we don't think of eternal peace or whatever they can't uh, do it. And then there's the reconciled society. That is um, the Frankfurt people, including from, you have to think went through a great disappointment. Marx had said, you know, that the working class would rise and the class of society would be established and so on. Well, the working class did rise in Paris in uh, uh, 1831 and uh, they did rise in 1848 a little bit and they did rise more in 1917 at the war in Hamburg and Munich and Germany and then in Russia and Petersburg and Moscow and then they lasted 70, 70 years or so but um, they overcame the counter-revolution from the West. Well, capitalist countries marched against Lenin and Lenin beat them. Then Hitler came and he was beaten in Stalingrad and so on but then the ruling class finally you know, we got it over um, threats. Reagan uh, spent three trillion dollars or so for weaponry, and the Russians did not want to respond to it, and rescued us that way, I would say. And uh, and then also the World Bank and making loans. And uh, I observed it personally in Yugoslavia, where Tito didn't want to impose, you know, new sacrifice on his people. They had suffered so much under fascism, he had liberated them, he kept them away from Russia, and, but he didn't want them to sacrifice them. It's called primitive capital accumulation. So he went to the bank in Paris and got money and built these hotels. And then he didn't produce enough in order to pay the interest. And so he accumulated and had to take new money in order to pay the interest. And so the whole Eastern Bloc, you know, was undermined that way, except Romania. Romania was the only country which didn't take any loans and there they killed the guy in the end, the socialistic leader there, so because of all the sacrifice he imposed on the people. So just yeah. Right, and his wife, I think. So um so that uh, uh nevertheless we, we uh, the in spite of the disappointment that the workers did not do what they were supposed to do, according to Marx. You know, like in Christianity the Messiah is just not coming. And according to the Jews, and he's still not coming. That is called the Parousia delay. According to Muslims, the Messiah, Jesus Messiah, is supposed to come after Ali, and he also doesn't come. So this is this painful Parousia delay, the open flank, the painful open flank for the whole Abrahamic uh, faith community, that the Messiah does not come. He hasn't come. He may come, when there are many people who still believe that. But he hasn't come. So for the Jews, he hasn't come for 2,800 years, and for the Christians for 2,000 years, and for the Muslims 1,400 years, and so that's 
a long time for finite human beings, right? So, and then all kinds of things, mysticism developed, like uh, 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 Jewish and Christian and Islamic mystic mystics, and then the secular people came and said, we have to do it ourselves. The Messiah may come or may not come, but we have to do it ourselves. And uh, that is where the bourgeois revolutions come in enlightenment, the socialistic revolution in enlightenment, and that process is still going on to some extent. Uh, if you look at Egypt, you know, analyze it in detail, what happens to the brotherhood there, Islamic brotherhood is a horrible type of a thing at the moment, you know. Since we want them to have under control for 50, 60 years, we kept them under control and paid people to do that, and now it's the same thing again. And, uh, I don't even know what happened to their leader, you know. They just put him away or whatever, so. Um, and similar things in all of these countries, you know, they they allowed them to have a political structure, but they kept the control over the economics of the whole thing, you know, and uh, and so they have to, this militia, they, this military thing in Egypt, you know, they, they work together with them as they did in the last half century uh, in order to keep the Brotherhood down, and they declared the Brotherhood to be a terrorist organization, you know. I mean, these are horrible type of developments in the struggle between when you think, you know, why the brotherhood cannot agree with the West, the separation of Uma and, and the state and so on, because Islam embraces the whole life, not only your personal thing, but your family and civil society and the economy and the state and so on. When you say separation of Uma and state, you say religion is privatized. It becomes now a private affair and you have to say religion should stay out of the family, should stay out of economy, should stay out of politics and so on. Uh, and uh, that is deadly, and and they see what has happened to Christianity, and they don't want this to happen to Islam. You know, that is what the whole struggle is about. It's in Libya, it's, it's in, in everywhere in Lebanon, and everywhere, um, because uh, the the brotherhood is a very embracing thing. You know, and uh, Hezbollah belongs to it to some extent, uh, brother, uh, the party of God, and uh, the Hamas people belong to it. And they are military, and but they are not only military; they are also political. Uh, they govern in, in Gaza. They are in the parliament in Lebanon, and they are charitable. They are social. They pay people, and they suffer. You know, wherever the money comes from, and that makes them very, very popular. So, if they would have real elections, the brotherhood would come through. So, I mean, not not elections which are fraudulent or whatever. If you have honest elections, because the majority. People are pious Muslims, and they would. Uh, it's only a smaller part which are influenced by the by the West, like you are now. That's what they are doing to you here. So, <laughs> so this. Uh, okay. That, that, so, in spite of that disappointment and the fact that school people were uh, former and so on, but terribly, uh, um, the, the German working class was supposed to rise against Hitler and to pay him. Hitler was paid by Henry Ford here. And by, by the German capitalist Siemens, Siemens, you know, the, what, the, our, what do we do? There was something in Siemens in North Carolina, I think. Uh, Siemens is very aggressive. They're good friends of Hitler, and Hitler, they paid Hitler too. And they have a new head now, an Austrian who speaks seven languages, an unbelievably intelligent guy. And he becomes very aggressive now. He pushes Siemens everywhere. And uh, the governor, government met there in North Carolina. They will set up a new whole big enterprise there. And so so uh, these people have paid Hitler. You know, so, but, and the workers did not rise. You know. Some of them were socialists. They did rise. They put them in the concentration camps. Others became fanatic Nazis, fanatic socialist, uh, national socialists. And, uh, and the masses of them still re just remained quiet and let it happen. And, marched with Hitler and killed people and so on. So that was a great disappointment. And so they did not emphasize so much anymore the third uh, goal there, the reconciled society, but they held on to it. And that's something very Jewish and also very Islamic and Christian, namely on one side to know the horrible reality of this world and not let go of the idea, not let go of uh, Allah, not get low of, of Yahweh and his law and so on. And there is a horrible contradiction between those two. But the Jews have given a good example through um, 4,000 years, even when they, uh, after, uh, after the year 70 or so, they had no government anymore which could enforce the law, and they still held on to it, uh, in spite of the fact of all what they suffered and, and so on. So um, that's something amazing about.
about obviously religions that they enable people to be very realistic and have no illusions about what this world is like and at the same time to hold on to this idea of goodness and holiness and beauty and so on no matter how ugly it is so that's a characteristic and, and that is what the Frankfurt School people have have too had and, and continue to have so uh, so I can see and then I'll turn the future of religion which are not so important for us here uh, that means there is this idea of fundamentalism go back to the Sharia law that's what the American administration is afraid of there are a million Muslims in Detroit and they say well they are nice and good now but when they get majority or whatever they will introduce Sharia law and they will destroy our constitution and so on so that is why they didn't give this uh, Professor Ramadan there his Tariq hmm? Ramadan? Yeah, right. They didn't give him visa. He was supposed to teach here in Notre Dame, and the government didn't allow him to come in. And that is the suspicion which is behind. Even when you have moderate people like he is, they still didn't want to have him. So, and then he went to England. I think he's in England now. Oxford, yeah. Oxford, yeah. Okay, so uh, nevertheless. This is, if it will ever be realized, that is another question. But there are people who would uh, like to uh, put the book Leviticus in the place of the Constitution, or, uh, and, and so on. So, and uh, then there is, of course, there are people who are secularists and who think that all religion is backward and belongs to the past, to the childhood of the human species, and we should get rid of it and become totally secular and grow up, and so on. So. Freud was one of our men who would have thought like this, you know, and maybe Marx to some extent as well, but not so much form now, and there we will see differences everywhere. And then, um, what we usually in Dubrovnik and Yalta pushed was the uh, way an openness to keep the discourse between religion and secular people open, that they don't uh, fundamentalistically say, you go to hell there, you secular people, or the secular people laugh about the religious people, the bishops and their idea of birth control and, and whatever. So that is not very fruitful. So we always thought that they should keep the discourse open with each other and maybe come closer to each other. So this is stem cell research. Um, the religious people don't want to kill embryos. Uh, the doctors want to find something against Alzheimer's. And can they have something in common? Of course, religious people are also against Alzheimer's and so on. So that they have in common. And then the biologists will also say, well, the human embryo is not exactly chimpanzee embryo. It's really human. And there they are agreeing then. But then, you know, is the embryo already a person, the carrier of rights and so on. And that is where they fall apart. But that doesn't mean that they have to kill each other now. But the science is moving, everything is moving, religion is moving, and so, you know, something may open up, who knows? So, things have up, opened up in the past. Religious people were against Galileo, most of them have learned that he was right. You know, people were against the, uh, the, the um, fellow there, the evolutionist, Darwin, and today most religious people think he was right. And so with Marx, so with Freud, and so on. So religious people can change, and also secular people can change. Okay, that is our thing there, and uh, that will help us to, uh, you know, to learn a little bit that vocabulary. Every science, every theory has its own language, and so as we use it, we will learn it. Rudy, what time do you want to start the film? Yeah, what time is it now? It's uh, only about ten after eight, so but yeah, we have I think time. we wanted to do two things. Um, I wanted to show a few things which you also have on the website, so we don't have to do too much, but just a little bit of it. Then. Do we have somebody who knows how is this is to be done? Uh, yeah. Okay, that is, you know, your brother's thing. But here's something in Habermas, we will see that. And one of you sent me today also another, another interview which was done with Form. So we can see him in person a little bit. So. But this one here, so only a few, maybe 10 minutes, we can do that while you are rest and then eat the cookies there. We can put this in there. <coughs> we just want to, uh, it's a lecture which I gave and <laughs> just what I say about Freud and Marx there may be helpful. 
Do you have to go to the toilet? That's upstairs. But there is enough water, I hope, for all of you. And there are hopefully also cookies for all of you. And you can stand up and relax and uh, try we put that in. And what we also want to do is uh, to have a Freud movie tonight. Um, yeah, I'll take this one. Because Freud is behind from and we want to introduce ourselves a little bit because when you come from Saudi Arabia then psychoanalysis may not be uh, um, you know known there. <coughs> yeah, take care of that <coughs> water there. the cookies. Okay. Oh, Katya. Katya is always a health fanatic. And she tortures me. And give me to eat.
came from the bourgeoisie, but they were somehow uh, alienated from this type of culture, and they tried to establish a new culture which had some uh, religious elements. It failed in the end. There is a little uh, uh, piece of poetry by uh, uh, by Montaner which describes that first experiment. So we could almost say that um, the critical theory was a critical uh, theory of religion before it became uh, a critical theory uh, of uh, society. So, uh, um, and when we started to develop the critical theory of religion out of the Frankfurt School and so on, we, we started with these, um, with these first poetical attempts, which were quite impressive. The same I would say that um, the, um, sometimes people say that um, the Horkheimer became religious later in his life or so. Um, Horkheimer was from the very beginning, he was raised Jewish in Stuttgart and then um, uh, also during, he was a member of the synagogue up to the end of his life in, in Switzerland. So there was always a religious underground, and uh, what the critical theory really combined was Judaism on one side and the modern enlightenment, or concretely they combined the Decalogue and the second and the third commandment, namely not to make images of the absolute, not to commit idolatry on one side, and on the other hand the philosophy of Immanuel Kant that the human mind, the human intellect, could not move into the realm of the thing in itself. That was God, uh, freedom, and immortality. That man had to stay with the finite things, and uh, Kant, nevertheless, uh, Montaigne, limited science, but he made also room for faith. And for uh, Kant, while one could not say anything about God, or freedom or immortality, uh, one could uh, at least uh, see it as a postulate. That means we needed God, freedom and immortality as a postulate in order to be able to live a human life and to uh, live a decent ethical life. So in that sense I would say the critical theory in itself had all the religious components and all what we did was to emphasize and uh, <coughs> this uh, uh, whole um, religious teaching uh, through 50 years in, in the Frankfurt School. That was the first and building, was so built by a Catholic the while the uh, South Africa uh, America was built it for them, and it was destroyed by the most closely uh, related by the, to, the, the, uh, the, uh, Air Force. Um, to the critical theory and the American society. Air Force. Uh, one could say that our theory emphasizes one antagonism in civil society, and that is the one between the religious and the secular, and the critical theory of religion tries to persuade people uh, not to close up the discourse between the religious and the secular fundamentalistically on one side, or positivistically and naturalistically on the other side. So the core of the critical theory of religion is to keep the discourse open. Okay, now comes Marx, and then comes Freud, and then we close. So the critical theory of religion has, of course, learned a lot from Karl Marx. Uh, it has learned to turn around the idealistic dialectic into a materialistic one, and uh, also concepts like um, productive forces, or productive relations, or surplus value, and so on. So first of all, uh, Marx um, was not so new as, as it may sound. He was deeply rooted in the philosophy of Hegel, in his dialectics, uh, and in Emmanuel Kant. And he was also rooted even in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And uh, so the um, Frankfurt School is also sometimes, uh, people have a prejudice that uh, it is Marxist or it's neo-Marxist and so on. But also the Frankfurt School is, of course, not only rooted in Marx, but also in Nietzsche and in Schopenhauer and in all the idealists like Schelling, Fichte, and Kant and so on. And then also particularly in the uh, um, Hebrew Bible, in the Decalogue, in the Second and the Third Commandment. And uh, this is true then also for the, uh, for the critical theory of religion, which we have uh, deducted from the critical theory of society. Karl Marx was a Jew and he was baptized in Lutheran uh, with his family, but um, he had a deep sensitivity 
bourgeoisie and bourgeois schools are always mentioning that opiate of the people. That was one of three uh, definitions which Marx gave of uh, religion in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of law. And uh, so even if one takes this, and uh, unfortunately bourgeois scholars never go any further than to, to the other two, but even if one takes the, uh, uh, the first one, what is wrong with opium if people are suffering uh, cancer patients or whatever? Uh, so even that uh, betrays some, some uh, sensitivity for religion. It can help people to uh, mitigate their suffering which they have. Um, the bad thing, of course, with uh, drugs is that they, people weaken or are weakened in their ability to transform the reality in such a way that it corresponds to their ability. Because happiness means that my ability and my possibilities outside are corresponding. If I have no possibilities and I have this tremendous potential, I will be unhappy. And vice versa, if I, I have these possibilities and I have no potential or whatever, that is also a very unhappy situation. And so that is the disadvantage of all opiates, of course. And so in that sense, it's a critical thing. And we have to see that Marx, first of all, didn't invent this, but he got it from Hegel. And Hegel had uh, 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 applied it only to Hinduism. So if Marx was justified now to apply that to all the world religions, what may have been true for Hinduism, and maybe not even for Hinduism adequately, that is a very serious scientific question now. But the definition of opiate is not an entirely negative one. Uh, if one, uh, what Marx has in mind is, you know, the suffering of the people under capitalism. But there were two other definitions, namely that religion is the heart of a heartless world and the outcry of the oppressed creature. This sounds prophetic. And these two other uh, definitions have to be taken as seriously as the opiate one, and unfortunately bourgeois scholars uh, forget this all the time. So uh, then uh, I would say that the critical theory and uh, of religion as we have developed it further takes very seriously Karl Marx's uh, Christology, namely there was once a poor man and the rich people murdered him. That is a very good uh, Christology from below, and it would be much better in the discourse between Christians and Muslims and Jews if one would start with such a Christology from below, as this is called, instead of a Christology from above. Jesus is always the capitalist and out of the temptation and so on, which may be very hard That's what the picture to, is about. to understand uh, uh, in a scholarly discourse with Jews and uh, Islamic people. So uh, this issue, there was once a poor man and the rich people murdered him. That would give the whole interpretation of the New Testament another uh, another uh, uh, perspective. But then Christianity is no longer in coalition with the ruling classes, uh, with the corporate ruling class, but it is on the side of the poor, as they say, I mean the side of the lower classes and the people who produce the surplus value, and uh, not on the side of the rich who enjoy the surplus value without working for it. Now we come to point. Form has written on both of them. has placed an important role for the uh, Frankfurt School. Already in 1930, there was a Freudian Institute in Frankfurt, and uh, it was combined with the uh, uh, theory of uh, society of the Frankfurt School from the very beginning. And we have a group of psychoanalysts who have partially been trained by Freud. Um, and uh, they came together and uh, did research about uh, the uh, situation of the German workers. And they followed the great uh, psychoanalyst uh, um, form and um, developed uh, a research uh, instrument by which they tested 8,000 uh, German workers in order to find out how many of them would be authoritarian personalities and how many of them would be revolutionary personalities. And they found out that maybe 10, 15% on each side, that means 15% uh, uh, revolutionary personalities and 
would follow Hitler fanatically and others who would go to concentration concentration camps for for this. So in that sense, uh, Freud played an important role. So, um, but they were also critical from the very beginning to some extent, of course, to a large extent, Freud was, of course, uh, enlightenment, an enlightenment person, uh, but at the same time, he also became a victim of um, the dialectic of enlightenment. So therefore, they, in a certain sense, uh, critically negated Freud, but also they preserved then and elevated in a certain way, wanted to fulfill the uh, great message of Freud. Okay, here we can close it. Okay, are there any questions about this? The theology question, please. Before we go, we can put the next one in, but we want to have a little discussion first. That is this one here, the Freud one there. You want to put That's the yeah. Freud one? Yeah, the Freud this one. Okay. You've got that one already over here. Oh, there, there it is over there. Oh, good, good, yeah. yeah. But we, before we do that, just leave it there for a moment. Is there anything, uh, what I said there, which, uh, which we should uh, discuss a little bit more? Could you uh, go over a little bit more uh, your discussion of Marx and the, the opiate of the masses things? That's the only yeah. side of that I've ever heard in any of the... Uh, so what, what did you hear and before? Uh, well, hear? I mean, I've, uh, I've read, you know, I've read that section of, uh, of his writing. Yeah. But yeah. we only, when we were talking about it in theory classes, we, we predominantly talked about it as a, uh, you know, the, the, the opiate of the masses in terms of keeping them somewhat blind to what is going on with kind of part of the ball really consciousness. Much, yeah, part of, it's, it's part of the ball consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I mean, um, we had that recently, I took my class to the psychoanalyst there at the hospital up there, and one psychoanalyst said, well, Freud, you know, got this thing with opium of the people, and then my students, of course, shouted and screamed right away, no, it was not Freud, it was Marx or whatever. But then the students did not know that Marx got it from Hegel, as I say there. But there's another link there. Hegel got it from Kant, whom you saw there too. And Kant makes really clear what it means and uh, where the others got it from. So Kant would say that uh, religion, you know, consoles people and it makes them feel good. But by making them feel good, it also dulls their conscience dulling their conscience. That is the definition of opium. So opium religion makes people feel good. We had, I had lectures there and Dustin was there where a woman said, I don't like the word antagonism, you know. I come here in order to feel good and you talk about antagonism and she never came back again, right? So a lot of religion is that feel good religion. This, I have a picture there, Jesus throwing the capitalists out of the temple, but I have a new one from 2006 and there are Wall Street people, you know, and Jesus throws them out and so on. And uh, the church people said, I shouldn't use that word. We want to be peaceful, you know, make everybody feel good and so on. So <laughs> that means what Marx uh, criticizes is that the bourgeois religion in London and in Paris and in Berlin and in Washington and so on, it consoles people, <laughs> but and that's not bad such, but it at the same time dulls their conscience so that they can live with a quiet and good conscience right here side by side with the slums on the other side of the way of Satan and don't feel anything. And that they kill one million people in Iraq and they don't feel anything. And that they, the food stamp thing there and they cancel it and they don't feel anything. And they don't give these people unemployment compensation and they don't feel anything. At the same time they say we're Christians. Or, you know, and then uh, quote, uh, quote uh, Paul, and Paul, you know, who doesn't work shouldn't eat. But the question is how they should get work, you know. Why the businessmen do not provide work? Because not the state which has to provide work, but the business community. And they don't, you know. So then they take that food away from them, and then they cannot even go out and, and, and get jobs and so on. So, and then they say at the same time they're Christian, and they go to church, and their wives go to church, and, and, and so on and so on. So, that is what he was against it. So 
they turned it around in his own mouth, you know, in a certain sense. They say, he's a bad guy because he says, you know, this is opium and so on. But in reality, he criticized these bourgeois characters who made a lie out of uh, Jesus, the founder, you know. And he said that once. He said, you know, why do you make a liar out of him with every word you say and everything you do, you know? That's what they're doing, conquest. You can see it from day to day, you know. So um, that is this opium story. So um, the Hegel thought, you know, the Hindus by uh, saying Om, 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 you know, and abstracting from everybody and become as abstract as Brahman is, you know, and then forget to uh, to build bridges and to build houses for the poor, you know. New Delhi is a mess, and so on. So uh, greatest democracy at the same time, you know, all these slums and this poverty. And so, so that was his, his critique. Now, when he said that all religions are doing that, that goes a little bit too far, you know. So one has to see to what extent Hinduism is really opium and then how much Judaism and Islam or whatever. But uh, so, I mean, what we have around here is to a large extent, you know, opium religion. So if people, if a minister would come up with a social gospel, which the Bosnians had uh, 60 years ago, uh, they would leave the church, like that woman did. She left because I um, was not consoling her, you know, and I wasn't making feel good. She had a son in Afghanistan, and so I'm not against, uh, um, you know, that she should be consoled and feel good, but she also has to think if Afghanistan is a just war or you know, of what we are doing there is a just thing and, and whatever. Or if after we have already decided that we will leave, we still let people die. You know, when I go out and see the campus, the flag there, I'm always afraid that the flag is down. Because whenever somebody from Michigan, the soldier dies in Afghanistan, they pull the flag down. So, and what, what is he dying for? The war is already lost, you know. The end is already determined. The troops will get out, you know. And, and, and they're still dying there. So all that, that is a matter of conscience. And when a religion does dull that conscience, then it's opium religion, according to Marx. Good. Do we have any other other question there about, about the movie there? And anything uh, sounds strange to you, right? Particularly our brothers here from... Saudi Arabia, but right? you come from another culture, and therefore, you know, some things may sound cookie to you. Um, so then you have to say that, right? Okay, that's what we are here for. Okay, is there anything else about this? Then we can go now to Freud there. So Form studied in Berlin, and he was in contact still with Freud. I don't know how much he, uh, he I don't think he was analyzed by Freud. Uh, psychoanalyzed. Uh, he analyzed Horkheimer, whom you saw there, so Form was the psychoanalyst for Horkheimer, and I think he also analyzed Landauer, who with him founded that uh, psychoanalytical institute, and Landauer, he fled from Frankfurt, a Jew, went to Holland, and practiced in Holland, and then the Germans marched into Holland, and they took him to concentration camp, and he starved to death there, so Form was very lucky that he, you know, could leave in time Germany and he went to Chicago and then he stayed here uh, after the war to, no, no, he went back to Europe, uh, he was in Mexico and then I think he went back to uh, Switzerland. <laughs> so, nevertheless, now let's look at the Freudian thing. So I have a very simple movie, so it's not very differentiated, you know, but I think as an introduction it's important because 
it. So the Freud analysis comes from Vienna and from London, and then it was watered down. So all these counselors which you have, or psychologists which counsel and so on, that is watered down type of stuff. And therefore it's important, you know, if they still remember something of Freud. Certainly from, you know, remember the lot. But um, also from does not simply take Marx or Freud. He is a revisionist. What is a revisionist? When text, the context changes, also the text changes, even the Holy Quran, even the Bible, and so on. And all it has to be reinterpreted in different ways. So that is what Fromm did. He said, you know, Marx lived in 880 and so on. In the meantime, two world wars have happened. The theory has to be changed. Um, Freud lived later but he lived still in a very patriarchal society. Now, in the meantime, the fathers have become very weak in the West. You know, they are little daddies, and sometimes they can still pay for the university. Most of them cannot, and so on. So the father has lost its authority. Psychoanalysis originally, you know, dealt with the authority of the father, played an important role for the superego, etc. So, so uh, that has changed, therefore it has to be revised. So, before, but before we see what, he, what revision he makes, we have to see the original Freud, and that's what we want to do. So Freud works with the model of the psyche. So we have social psychology. Psychology means talk about the psyche. Psyche, religious people talk about the soul. And um, religious people think of the totality of the soul. Modern psychologists take out an instinct, a motivation, or something like that, split it up. They don't know anything about the whole of the soul anymore but they know simply some aspects, anxieties, or polar, polar personalities, or bipolar personalities, or whatever. So, so let's start with the model of Freud, which also Fromm still uses. And when he has struggles with Marcuse and Horkheimer and so on, it has something to do with a different interpretation or revision of this model. The model is the psyche is the body, and the sense that body and psyche are identical and are different at the same time. So Freud was first a brain specialist, and he wanted to heal people, you know, by uh, hypnosis and so on. And then he developed his own, by 1900, he developed his own method, and uh, took the psyche more seriously again. <coughs> and so you have the environment of the psyche, you have the ego development, you have a superego which differentiates from the ego, and both of them differentiate from the id. The id is the will to life. It is the will to life which has two components, uh, the libido, it's not only sex, phallic sex in a narrow sense, it's any desire for cars and airplanes and whatever we love in a certain sense. Uh, and then on the other side we have this aggression, this killer instinct, and uh, which uh, Freud did not want to uh, subscribe to up to his late age. He uh, found out, found out that people always in the hospital didn't want to go home; they wanted to die. Dr. Quark in here, there he emphasized this, uh, and uh, and uh, Freud didn't understand it. But finally he said. So now we are in the camp of Schopenhauer again, and Schopenhauer has this killer instinct in us. So when we sit here peacefully, nobody thinks, you know, that we are killers in, inside. But the question is, what happens when you get into certain circumstances and you panic, or, uh, you know, the then unconscious forces can break through. So now um, Freud finally talked about that killer instinct, but Marcuse and from didn't really like it, and so they came up with the solution that only when our libido, our love is frustrated, then we become killers. So let's see, uh, you love a girl, but she doesn't want to have you, and then we get angry and we want to kill her or, or ourselves, you know. Lovers commit suicide like Romeo and Juliet and, and so on. So, um, but if, you know, our libido could live itself out, in a normal way, and our needs would be fulfilled, we would be rather peaceful people. So there is a difference if you take an instinct, a killer instinct, as a separate instinct, or if you take only this life instinct, and then you say, if it is frustrated, I don't have a job, they fire me, then I go take a revolver in the post office and shoot
include my superiors or whatever as it has happened so often now you know that so that is the question now and we have to see how form and Habermas and Hannes solve this so if we don't have anything else then we can look at that Freud movie there we still have 20 minutes and uh, maybe we can give part of it okay
Because of this apathy, methods of treating mental illness were crude. Doctors looked only for physical causes and used physical treatment. Then Freud left his laboratory. He found that his private patients did not fit these prescribed patterns. They came here, dozens of women, day after day over the years, with paralysis, severe pain, constant vomiting, hallucinations, severe disturbances of sight and speech. Naturally, I looked for physical causes, but could find none. Yet they suffered, suffered intensely. Doctors called these patients hysterics and despised them. They were shared. Yeah, this comes from Historon. It's in the uterus. Then they thought only women can be hysterical, then Freud found out what also men do? can be hysterical. Joseph Breuer, a friend and colleague, had some success with hypnosis. One of his patients talked freely about her past, and somehow her paralysis and difficulties of speech and vision would be improved. But we know now it was not the hypnosis. I soon discarded that. It was talking about painful memories that was the effect of... You'll see an analysis now how it takes place. These memories seem to be deeply hidden in my patient's mind. Now, uh, this also goes to our woman and not a working class woman. Anything so at all. It's very much a bourgeois arrangement, the psychoanalysis. Yes. Continue. Oh, it has just occurred to me. A single word. Yes. Oh, it's too silly. It's also called the speaking analysis or speaking oh, yes. therapy. In opposition to the I chemical know. stuff which the <laughs> psychiatrist prescribes. Let's go. Yes. to the family. I remember I got the impression of a demon striving not to come to the light of day because that would be the end of him. That refers to the past. Tom, yes. Freud 
Freud began his historic voyage into the nature of our unconscious mind, the mind that had puzzled man for so long. But it was at first a stormy voyage. In 1896, Freud spoke to doctors in Vienna on the sexual origins of hysteria. There was silence. It was as if there was a wall around me. The chairman was brief. It sounds like a scientific fairy tale. Then the insinuations about my personal morals began. At that time, I was certain that my patients were in the grip of painful memories which they had driven into their unconscious minds. I was also certain that these repressed memories were sexual in nature. Almost always, the seduction of the child by her own father. Dr.
were they? What did they mean? Then I recollected that a few days before my dream, I had seen an illustrated Bible with pictures of Egyptian gods and Jewish heads taking part in funeral rites. The figure on the litter was, of course, my mother. And my terror was caused by fear that she was dead. It seems obvious, does it not? A simple fear of my mother's death. But this is only what I call the manifest meaning of the dream, the surface meaning. Even while we dream, our senses are at work disguising the true and forbidden meanings of our dreams. When I dug deeper, I found that the image on the litter was a memory of my dying grandfather. Grandfather. Mm. So perhaps I had well, placed my the family on that very important individual and, and the those family. words had another meaning. A few days before my dream, I had been playing with Philip, the neighbor's boy. Okay. He was talking about sexual intercourse, and he used a vulgar term unknown to me. It was furium in German, and it came directly from the German word for bird, vulgar. The forbidden meaning of the dream was revealed, the latent meaning, the hidden meaning censored by the conscious part of my dreaming mind. The anxiety disguised by the dream was sexual anxiety. I dream really with a jealous wish for the death of my father and erotic desire for my mother. That's the Oedipus complex. So maybe we'll start here and we'll look at it the next time. The association. And with his own dreams and associations, Freud developed okay, principles. Okay, so assignment is once more to look at the website, to look at the uh, syllabus, the course description, and that's it. And the roadmap. Take some cookies. Have some left still. There we are. Okay, very good. Thanks for coming. Be careful when you go out there now. Then whoever is last needs to lock all the doors. Do you have a place for uh, empty bottles to recycle them? Oh, well, sure, yeah.